Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for watching this talk. My name is Anna Goldfield. I'm an archaeologist, science writer, and podcaster. I'll be combining all of those vocations in this discussion of why good science communication is so tremendously important. I'm going to do that with a look at Neanderthals, my own subject of study, and how the public perception of our extinct relatives has shifted since the discovery of the species. When science is taught in schools, it's often with the subtext that there are laws in place that govern how the world works and that science itself is something rigid or immutable. Thus, when scientists reach a conclusion, that conclusion stands. Instead, science is a process by which we understand our world through trial, error, and repetition. When new information becomes available, that understanding changes. Unfortunately, this reality doesn't mesh with the perceived finality of science, and so when scientists circulate new information to the public, it often comes across as manipulative, politically driven, or simply wishy-washy. Good science communication, through whatever media, counteracts misinformation and misunderstanding. One of the most important things a researcher can do is to move outside of their insular circle of expertise and explain to a broad audience what they're doing, how they do it, and why their research matters. So on to our Neanderthal example. This is one of the first mostly complete Neanderthal skeletons to be discovered. The remains, those of a male, probably in his 40s at the time of death, were found in 1908 at the French site of La Chapelle aux Saintes. So this individual is referred to as Chapelle aux Saintes I, or sometimes informally, the old man of La Chapelle. Pictured here is a cast of his remains, which you can see are quite complete, apart from a few missing bits of his extremities. The remains were examined by the eminent French prehistorian and wielder of a top-notch mustache, Marcelin Boulle. Boulle published his description of the old man of La Chapelle, which contained a thorough description of Boulle's reconstruction of the stature and appearance of the living individual. For several reasons, though, this reconstruction was flawed. Boulle's Neanderthal was much more hunched than the real individual would have been, owing to osteoarthritis on the spine and some error in Boole's reconstruction. From the robust bones, Boole determined that the Neanderthal would have been very muscular, which is accurate. Neanderthals were a bit stockier, shorter, and more heavily muscled than Homo sapiens. But also, Boole very much fell into the pitfall of assumption prevalent at the time that if Neanderthals came before Homo sapiens, then surely they must be far more primitive. And this accumulation of stature, muscularity, and primitiveness is the image that persists even to this day. This artist rendering from 1909 of the Neanderthal of Chapelle Saint is one of the first that the public was introduced to and informed much of the public literature of the next few decades. So it's hardly surprising that still today, as evidenced by this tweet on the right, that President Biden could re reference Neanderthal thinking and intend it as an insult. And of course, images like these in popular media reinforce the stereotype of the Neanderthal as a muscle-bound hairy brute with low intelligence. But the Neanderthal is experiencing a bit of a renaissance lately, and the image of the numbskull caveman is starting to fade, which is wonderful, because the Neanderthal species was in fact very similar to Homo sapiens, and they deserve to be understood as the complex and intelligent human cousins that they truly were. We know from archaeological evidence, for example, that Neanderthals used materials like bone and wood to make their tools, meaning that their technologies were much more complex than the stereotypical club or rock hammer. We know that they were able to control fire as a tool and used it to extract pitch from tree bark to use as an adhesive. They used this adhesive to create compound tools, attaching stone tips to wooden shafts. 
While there are no living Neanderthals to examine or speak to, we know that they had all of the anatomical features necessary to produce the same kinds of speech that we humans use. There is also evidence, though it's very, very rare and fragmentary, that Neanderthals created twine and other fiber-based technologies. There are even examples of Neanderthal symbolic behavior like self-adornment, and although this is still under debate, there's evidence for Neanderthal art. Previously, because of the types of animal remains typically found at Neanderthal sites, it was thought that they exclusively hunted and ate large game animals with little dietary variability. Now, thanks to studies of minute particles found in the mineralized plaque of Neanderthal teeth, we know that they used much more of the resources around them. The Neanderthal diet varied depending on where they lived and what was available to them, but they certainly ate plant foods and even cooked starches. Neanderthals were also capable of exploiting marine resources when living in a coastal environment. We have evidence of seafood meals from a cave site in Portugal that shows that they harvested shellfish and crab. In short, in all aspects of their behavior, evidence is mounting to show that Neanderthals were extremely similar to Homo sapiens. This information is slowly starting to filter into the public consciousness thanks to publications like National Geographic seizing on the influx of amazing research and making Neanderthals something of a hot topic. The fact that interbreeding between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens means that some humans have Neanderthal DNA has also been a major impetus for this interest. In a shameless but extremely relevant mention of my own work, I published an interactive series of articles for sapiens.org, an online public anthropology journal all about the Neanderthal body. I highlighted different parts of the anatomy to illustrate how we know what we know about Neanderthals and some of the similarities and differences between our two species. The book Kindred by Rebecca Rag Sykes was published just last year and is a beautifully written and accessible book for any audience about Neanderthals, and it packs a mind-boggling amount of wonderfully synthesized research into its pages. These are just a few examples of public interest in Neanderthals driven by effective science communication. So in a bit of a whirlwind tour, we've gone from a perception of Neanderthals as unintelligent subhumans to a dynamic population of complex, intelligent, close relatives who were very much like us. In any discipline, not just archeology span and anthropology, the translation of science for the public is so important because it helps people to relate that science to their own lives, making it relevant and important to them. Good science communication, like the work that has shown the human nature of Neanderthals, helps us see the human element in our understanding of the world. Thank you all for listening.